Good morning and welcome to the house of the Lord on this beautiful summer Sunday. If you're visiting with us today and you're looking for a church home, stop looking. You found a home here. We want you to join our church and be a part of what God is doing here. If you're a vacationer, we're glad that you took time from your vacation to join us here in paradise and, uh, and worship the Lord this morning. There's several announcements in the bulletin about things going on, but the most important of which is Vacation Bible School. I am excited. Crystal just gave me this giant bow tie to wear. I'm really thrilled to try it on. It's Monday. It's going to be a wonderful, a wonderful week, and I want to have Crystal come and, and share with us a little bit more about how, we, um, how you all can be involved in this uh, big week of our muscles. Come and help. Uh, at 2 o'clock today. Um, Vacation Bible School is such a highlight of our summer. It's so meaningful to all the children as they get exposed to the gospel. Many of the children that will be a part of our Vacation Bible School won't be members of our church and won't have a church home. It's just a wonderful gift to our community to have this, and, and I'm just so excited about it and, uh, and Crystal's great uh, leadership of this uh, Vacation Bible School this year. This morning as we... Um, go to the Lord in prayer, I want to highlight some of the new additions to our prayer list. Um, the names that are asterisk, Sue Gibbs, Julie Lanier, Patsy Dandridge Pennington. I also um, want to um, remind you to pray for Darlene Spencer. She's here today. She goes in for surgery um, tomorrow on her neck. Our prayers are with her. And we also lift up the Weldon family, Bill Weldon. Um, passed away this, uh, this last Saturday. Uh, his service of death and resurrection will be at Dow Rada United Methodist Church outside of Montgomery on Tuesday at 11 o'clock Central Standard Time. I believe that there are some folks from our church that are headed that way, and if you would want to carpool with them, they are leaving at 6 o'clock on uh, Tuesday morning to be there for that service. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Merciful God, we give you thanks that your mercies are new every morning. Today, as we gather to worship, we pray that you will open up our hearts so that we can receive your Son into our lives. We pray that you would open up our ears so that we may hear your word proclaimed, that you may open up our eyes that we may see Jesus. Send your Holy Spirit upon us as we worship today. Transform us into the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. We pray for those in our community that are sick, those that need healing, that you would reach your hand down and touch them and raise them up. We pray for those in our community that grieve, for the Weldon family and the Fulcher family, Give them strength. Send your spirit to be their comforter. We pray for the poor in our community, the hungry today, those without shelter, those without health care. Comfort them and give them strength. We pray for your church here in Fort St. Joe, that your Holy Spirit would continue to move and give us strength and life in Jesus Christ. We pray for our district for our conference, our United Methodist denomination, and your church universal. Help make us one in purpose for the sake of your gospel. Most of all, we give you thanks for Christ Jesus, our Lord. And through him, we pray the this great This morning, prayer. I will be reading from the New Life Version in the book of Romans, chapter 8, verses 1 through 11. Now, because of this, those who belong to Christ will not suffer the punishment of sin. The power of the Holy Spirit has made me free from the power of sin and death. This power is mine because I belong to Christ Jesus. The law could not make me free from the power of sin and death. It was weak because it had to work with weak human beings. But God sent his own son. He came to earth in a body of flesh, which could be tempted to sin, as we in our bodies can be. He gave himself to take away sin. 
By doing that, he took away the power sin had over us. In that way, Jesus did for us what the law said had to be done. We do not do what our sinful old selves tell us to do anymore. Now we do what the Holy Spirit wants us to do. Those who let their sinful old selves tell them what to do live under that power of their sinful old selves. But those who let the Holy Spirit tell them what to do are under his power. If your sinful old self is the boss over your mind, it leads to death. But if the Holy Spirit is the boss over your mind, it leads to life and peace. The mind that thinks that only of ways to please a sinful old self is fighting God. It is not able to obey God's laws. It never can. Those who do what their sinful old selves want to do cannot please God. But you are not doing what your sinful old selves want you to do. You are doing what the Holy Spirit tells you to do if you have God's Spirit living in you. No one spirit lives because you are right with God, and yet your body is dead because of sin. The Holy Spirit raised Jesus from the dead. If the same Holy Spirit lives in you, he will give life to your bodies in the same way. This is Today the word we, of the um, Lord. Have a very special guest, our brand new district superintendent, Dr. Larry Briars and his wife, uh, Vicki. Larry has been uh, the senior pastor at Shalimar United Methodist Church, a big uh, church over to our west. And uh, we are delighted that he was recently appointed uh, to our district. He started his job at the beginning of July. And, uh, and we are just honored to have a, a brand new superintendent. Our district um, is a wonderful coastal district and uh, with, some, with some beautiful churches. But I know, um, I know which church is the best church in the district. Yeah. And we are, I think we're convincing him of that today. Uh, Larry is a great, uh, a great preacher. You'll find that out this morning. And, um, and I, what I think is uh, most valuable to our conference is Larry has been a great spiritual leader. Uh, to our conference, I want you to pray for him every day as he goes about his new task. I think that God has sent him to us and to our district for a very special purpose. Our district uh, needs his leadership and guidance and and I want us to covenant to, um, to lift him up in prayer regularly and, uh, and our district and conference as well. Let's give Dr. Larry Briars a warm Port St. Joe welcome. Thank you. Thank you. I hope, I'm, I hope this is on. It's good to be here. I'm so glad to be with you all today. Uh, it's very exciting to be here. Now, I want to start off by saying uh, I've gotten a message. Nobody else has to tell me not to move Jeffrey. <laughs> so that's a hello I'm so and so don't move Jeffrey <laughs> so we don't need that anymore I'm glad to be here though what a great thing it's great to be with Jeffrey and Liz Bobby great to be with you you're so blessed to have her as well right yeah I haven't met uh, her husband, Clay, but he's serving one of our churches. So uh, you have such a great uh, group of folks that uh, are your clergy here at the church. Uh, also want to uh, say thank you to the musicians this morning and beautiful song. Hilda was beautiful uh, playing for us as well. And uh, Melinda, thank you for reading for us this morning as well. Uh, we uh, are, have already been blessed in this service and you can just tell that the spirit of God is very much a part of this church here. Uh, the service this morning was wonderful, and uh, I can just sense that, you know, you can tell when you walk into a church where there's love, where there's harmony, where there's the Holy Spirit's presence, and you can tell that that's here. <clears throat> and that kind of church moves forward and grows and becomes the church that God wants it to be, and I know you're moving in that direction. I can sense that that's happening. I want to say that you're just tremendously blessed, aren't you, to be living in this area? This is one of the most beautiful places, and Vicki and I uh, have enjoyed coming down here and, 
and uh, staying at the uh, Port Inn. Thank you for putting us up last night. We didn't have to get up yesterday to get here since you have the hour change. And uh, so thank you for putting us up. But one of the things that we've noticed, uh, Vicki and I love Israel and we've made several trips over there. And <clears throat> we were sitting in the uh, uh, restaurant last night. And you may have heard this before, but uh, this bay out here just reminds you so much of the Sea of Galilee. Now the mountains are lower, you know, there's not any mountains around as much, but uh, it just reminds you of that sea and some of the people were out there yesterday uh, with the, in the boat standing up fishing <clears throat> and it just looked like the Sea of Galilee. Uh, and some of you have shared with me, yes, this is the Holy Land and, <laughs> and that you do feel that way about the place that you live. So it's good to be here in God's good country and uh, God's Holy Land, which is a Holy Land for us all. Uh, I want to share with you a couple of passages today uh, before I share with you the message. And uh, you've already heard one from Romans, and it ties so well into what I'm going to be sharing with you today. And we didn't even coordinate that together, but you know, God knows. And uh, so it, it does tie right into what I want to share with you today. So first of all, I want to share an Old Testament passage, and then I'll go to an, uh, over to one of the epistles as well. But uh, we are going to look first at Isaiah 43, verses uh, 14 through uh, 19. This is what the Lord says, your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, for your sake I will send to Babylon and bring down as fugitives all the Babylonians in the ships in which they took pride. I, the Lord, your Holy One, Israel's creator, your King. This is what the Lord says, he who made a way through the sea, a path through the mighty waters, who drew out the chariots and horses, the army and the reinforcements together, and they lay there never to rise again, extinguished, snuffed out like a wick. Forget the former things, though. Do not dwell on the past. See, I'm doing a new thing. Now it springs up to you. Do you not perceive it? I'm making a way in the desert and streams in the wasteland. And then in 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 5, verses 14 uh, through 17. <clears throat> For Christ's love compels us uh, because we are convinced that one died for all and therefore all died. And he died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves but for him who died for them and was raised again. So from now on we regard no one from a worldly point of view though we once regarded Christ in that way. We do not do that any longer. Therefore if anyone is in Christ they are a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold the new has come. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our Lord, how we praise you that we can be here today to worship you, to love you, to sense your presence here with other brothers and sisters in Christ, to be able, Lord, to live in this beautiful place that you've given these beautiful people. I pray, Lord, that even as we come together to worship today, that our hearts would still be open to you, that you would make them fertile ground for the gospel message. In Jesus' name we pray it. Amen. There was an article in the newspaper not long ago about a 71-year-old man who had his life saved in a very unusual way. It seems that this truck came along and crashed into his home. It, uh, it hit the, the porch and tore up the porch and part of the house as well. Now that had nothing to do with, uh, with him being harmed in any way, but because the house was pretty much messed up and destroyed in many ways, they had to send repair people out there. So they sent, of course, the gas man, they sent the uh, electricians and all of those to come and do their work. They discovered in the process that he had about two feet of leaves that had built up in his chimney. Now, when he would start a fire, the smoke could get through, but the carbon monoxide poisoning was backing up into his house. When he heard about this, he said, well, you know, that explains it then. That explains why I've had those flu-like symptoms, the chills, the nausea, the shakes, the headaches. And there were times that I would even black out, and when I'd wake up, I'd be laying out in the yard. And so you see that when he would get out there and get the fresh air, he would come too again. Now, the irony in all of this was that he was a building contractor. And he should have known better. And he had warned people many times about making sure that they kept their chimney clean. In the article, he is quoted as saying, but somehow it never dawned on me to check my own chimney. Doesn't that say something to us spiritually? 
that often we are good at checking everybody else's chimney, but not necessarily checking our own. And the scriptures even have something to say about that. It says to us, we need to be careful that we get the speck out of our own eye before we attempt to go take the board out of our neighbor's eye. Uh, I'm sorry, it's the other way around. Make sure we get the board out of our eye before we attempt to take the speck out of our neighbor's eye. You see, we may see the speck in the neighbor's eye, but not necessarily realize that we can be blinded by our own issues and by our own struggles and problems. Therefore, Isaiah reminded us that we should forget the former things, not dwell on the past anymore, and be able to see that God is doing a new thing. I love to hear those words from our Lord through Isaiah. I am doing a new thing. And then as we go over to 2 Corinthians, it reminds us as well, all, uh, all of the old can pass away. Behold, all things become new. God help us. God help us to become new creatures and new creations in Christ. That's encouraging good news, isn't it? God always wants to do a new thing in our life. No longer do we have to be confined by our past. No longer do we have to be limited to who we have been in our life. We are not bound up by uh, who our parents were or what our past has been, but God wants to make us a new creature, a new creation. God is always in our lives wanting to do a new thing. I see God working in our world in such a way that he wants to bring about a new thing. We just celebrated our independence, and we know that we are blessed to be free, and I do believe that that's God's will, that we people would be free. He created us with free will, wanting us to have the freedom, and, and even the scriptures tell us that Jesus said, I came that you might be free, and free indeed. I remember when I was younger how we feared the Russians. Do you remember that? Some of you are old enough. Others of you would never remember that, but you would hear it on TV, you'd hear it on the news, our parents would talk about it, and we were afraid. And there were other uh, things like that that came up uh, along the way <clears throat> as we were uh, growing up that people would talk about that made you fear, you know, and we could be bound somewhat by that fear. Eventually, God did a new thing in the world, and things began to change in the Soviet Union. And I had the opportunity even to go and visit there and to preach there and to preach there shortly after the doors opened for the gospel message to come in. I got the chance to spend some time with some of the Russians, spent some weeks with them and went back and did it again. And they would come over here and spend some time with us. And it was part of a mission just to build relationships. And as I saw Russia and what it was like, it, I, I wondered why were we ever afraid of those people? And, and as I said, I hope there's no Russians here today that would take offense at this, but it just seemed that they were like 50 years behind us in technology and, and, and behind the West and, and most things. And I thought, you know, I, I don't know that that fear was even uh, well-founded, you know. But yet, things begin to change. God began to bring about change in this world. And it's exciting to see that God, I think, is always on the side of freedom and seems to support the side of of freedom. According to the scriptures, it appears that way anyway. Uh, there's an interesting story by Archibald Rutledge, who is an author that's written probably 50, 60 books. Uh, and he tells a story in one of his books uh, about when he was a child and he was able to capture a young mockingbird that had fallen from the tree. And he put that mockingbird in a cage and he sat it in the window. And it always kind of reminds me of that episode of Andy Griffith, you know, where Opie catches the, the birds and he puts it in the cage. Any of you Andy Griffith fans here, you know, maybe you've seen it. Do even any of you know who Andy Griffith is? You know? <laughs> but anyway, he puts the little bird in the cage and he sits it in the window, probably because there was no air conditioning or something like that. And Archibald put the, the cage in the window. And as he put it in the window, uh, the mother mockingbird came up to the cage and fed the baby mockingbird a berry. And he thought, how wonderful this is. I'm not, this is not even going to be hard. It's not even going to be hard to take care of this little bird. I'm just going to leave it there in the cage, and the mother bird is going to feed it. I'll have a nice little pet. But as he went over to the cage before too long, he found that his little mockingbird had died. He never understood that. He didn't know what happened until some years later when he met an ornithologist and uh, I hope I'm saying that right, and, and if you don't know what it is, it's a bird specialist, which I should have just said in the beginning. But he asked the question, what happened? What, what was the deal with that? And he told uh, the story. 
And Arthur Wayne, the bird specialist, said, a mother mockingbird finding her young in a cage will sometimes take the, take the baby a poison berry. She thinks it's better for the one that she loves to die rather than to live in captivity. Interesting, isn't it? Interesting and a sad story as well, but yet a very sound principle that all creatures really long to be free. And all of us long to have that freedom, especially we like uh, freedom in this world, but we should also want personal freedom as well. The baptism covenant that we make uh, when we uh, come to be baptized, it's used so often in, in the Methodist church. And we ask people, will you resist injustice and oppression in whatever forms they present themselves? Because as Methodists, we've been taught that we should not degrade people in any way. God longs for his people to have freedom. And he's always, I think, still working in this world. And I see the hand of God at work in the world in so many ways, always working, bringing about a new thing. Now, I say that to say that I believe God also wants to bring about a new thing in our own individual lives. It doesn't matter how old we are or what state we are in in life or how long we've been a Christian. I believe God still wants to do a new thing in our life. Uh, I became a Christian many years ago. I think I was 17 years old. I accepted the, the call to ministry uh, somewhere around my 20s. But just a few weeks ago, the Lord did a new thing and pulled me from a church that I love to put me in a district that I'm going to love. I am already loving this district, and you're helping so much. <clears throat> and by the way, Miss Martha, thank you for the cake this morning. That helped so very much in my acceptance of the district. Uh, <laughs> you feed me cake, I'm happy. <laughs> So thank you for that this morning. But, but that's, the, uh, that's the way it is for us that uh, uh, God wants to bring about a new thing. And, and, and it was just a few weeks ago that I had to say yes to God again to this new thing God is bringing about in my life. Uh, I, I don't know where I would be today. I don't know where my life would be if I hadn't accepted Christ. I realized that I would be living a very different life. When I accepted Christ, the old passed away. And so many of the things that I had dealt with as a young person, <clears throat> I could put behind me now. I, I didn't have to be bound to the things that, that had been a part of my life. Jesus came to die for me and accepting him, I was free. And no longer did I have to look back because the old had passed away and behold, all things had become new, and I was a new creature and a new creation, and now I'm in the hands of a God who wants to bring about new things in my life and continues to do that. And even though I, I have been in ministry for 35 years, God is still wanting to do a new thing. And I hope and pray that no matter how old we are or what our situation is, that our hearts are open to hear from God, to see what new thing God might want to bring about in our own lives. Sin is still so prevalent out there and there's so many people that, that are still bound up in that and all they have to do is just open their heart and God can change it so quickly. You, you know, we, we uh, talked about um, and, and I prayed about in the beginning for our hearts to be fertile ground to be able to receive the gospel message. But the truth is too that the heart can be such fertile ground for sin to grow. And develop. In 1884, at the New Orleans uh, Cotton Exposition, there was an exotic water flower that was put on display. <clears throat> we now just call them water lilies. You pretty much see them everywhere. But it had this orchid like bloom that came from Venezuela. Well, as they had it there on display, there in Louisiana, uh, thousands of women went through there looking at it, probably some men too as well, but they would pick off just a little piece of that, hoping that they could take it home and let it take root. Maybe grow it in their own ponds or in their own streams or lakes or whatever. And they did take root and they took over. They took over the streams and the rivers and some have totally blocked some of the streams and the rivers as you ride down the rivers and you can see that, that those lily pads, as we call them, are just all over the place. It did not take long for them to take root. In fact, they say that each one of those can reproduce itself a thousand times in a two-month period. 
Now you see, that's the way that sin can grow in the human heart. It doesn't take much for it to start. Just a glance, just a word, just a small resentment. Anything like that can cause it to begin. And before we know it, it can take root and it can reproduce itself. And before we know it, we've been caught up in something that we wish we had never gotten caught up in. And yet the human heart can so easily turn in that direction. And it can still happen for us as Christians. We've given our heart and our life to the Lord, but oh, how easy it is to turn away from the Lord and to do the things that we know we should not do. It just seems like that it is that part of our human nature that, that we just can't help. It's like I said, uh, you know, as we have our children, we don't have to teach a child how to be bad. They figure that out on their own. You have to teach a child how to be good, and we work on that all the time. The bad, they get it. You know, they figure that out themselves. But it's that part of our human nature and who we are that we seem to be drawn to the things that are, can be forbidden, those things that would cause us to take the most precious things in our life and throw it away. Such a great mystery. Such a great mystery of why we can't always choose the best and why we can't always choose the things that are good for us and the things that God wants to do for us, the new things that God desires in our heart and our life. In 1970, 41 uh, whales were beached on the Oregon shore. Uh, people, 5,000 people turned out to try to, to get them back in the water. They found out that it was pretty hard to move those 15 ton whales. Couldn't even hardly get one back in the water. But a scientist came along and eased their guilt and said, you know, I'm telling you, even if you should happen to get them back in the water, there's a great likelihood that they'll turn around and swim right back to the shore and beach themselves again. Isn't that a great mystery? Why would something like that, a great creature like that, seek to self-destruct? Not such a great mystery. We see people doing it all the time. All the time. People can see what's right, what's good, the great things that God has for us, and yet somehow we are just drawn to the self-destruction. God help us. That's the way sin is. But God wants to do a new thing. God wants to do a new thing in each life. He wants to come into each heart and life as we accept him by faith. And in doing so, then all the old has passed away and behold, everything becomes new. And even if now in our lives there are things that we struggle with, God still gives us that assurance that we can come to him and the old can be behind us and we don't have to struggle with the guilt and the struggles and the things that bind us up of the past. But instead we can be set free and all things can become new. So maybe it's time for us to do a new thing. Maybe it's time for us to, uh, to, to seek God in a new and a different way. Maybe it's time for us to, to get back on our knees and say, Lord, uh, maybe I've, I've let my own Christian life become stagnant and maybe I'm not feeling that I'm really fulfilling the plan that you have for my life. I know that you can forgive me. I know that you can restore me even right now where I am and you can do a brand new thing in my life. God desires to do that. God desires to make us new creatures and new creations and to do something new in our heart and in our life. You know, you've heard of firemen before and I say firemen and I, and I know that they're fire women as well, but I'm going back to the origin of the word fireman. As we go back to the original word of the fireman, a fireman was not a person who put out fires. A fireman was a person who started fires. What they would do is they would dress in as much of a fireproof suit as they could, and they would go down in the mines with fire. And they went ahead of all the miners that were going to go down there and work in the days ahead, but they went ahead to find the gas leaks. Because with gas leaks down there, of course, uh, the miners would quickly die, shut up in those mines. So they went down to find the gas leaks and they took fire with them. And any time that they would come up upon a gas leak or gas fumes, of course those things would ignite and they would be able to find where the gas leaks were. And the firemen went ahead of them so that all the others could come in and follow along behind them and they would have a good place to work and to be. That is what Jesus Christ has done for us. 
Jesus Christ is my fireman. Jesus Christ is your fireman. He has gone before us and has prepared the way. He has sacrificed himself that we might be saved. He has been wounded that we could be healed. He has known death that we might have life and have it eternally if we repent of our sins and we have faith in him. There's a great uh, comic strip by one of my great uh, favorite theologians, Charles Schultz. I don't know if you have read uh, any of the Peanut comic strips, but he always seems uh, to say something profound, it seems. Uh, there's a great comic strip of Lucy uh, being upset because her mother, I guess she was bad, and her mother told her she could not have a birthday party. And so she's livid about this at her mother, and she says, you promised me a birthday party, and now you say I cannot have one. It's just not fair. And the next uh, screen has her talking to Linus, and Linus says to her, you're not using the right strategy. Why not go up to your mom and say to her, I'm sorry, dear mother. I've admit I've been bad. You were right to cancel my party, but from now on, I shall try to be good. And the last frame has Lucy with her mouth wide open. And she says, I'd rather die. <laughs> and yet that is what we might feel toward all the wonderful things God has done for us. What a wonderful thing God has done for us in sending Jesus Christ to love us and to die for us so that we might have eternal life. And all of his gifts are laid out there for us to have. All the wonderful things that God desires to give his people. He wants to take your life, put the past behind you, let all the old be passed away, and behold, let everything become new. You can be a new creature, and yet we still see people who seem to say, I'd rather die first. I'd rather die first before I would admit that I'm wrong before I would admit that I've done anything wrong, before I would admit that there's sin in my life. And yet we see a lot of people in the world. You know, look around, they're not here, right? So many that resist the wonderful and the, and the good gifts of God. And God desires to do something good in our lives, to do a new thing in our life. Even now, even now at whatever stage of life you're in, God still desires to do a new thing. So listen once more to this scripture. Forget the former things. Do not dwell on the past. See, I'm doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? I'm making a way in the desert, in the streams, and the wasteland. If you give your heart and life to him, according to Corinthians, it also reminds us all the old has passed away. Behold, all things can become new. Let's pray. Oh God, how we long to be who you want us to be, to be your man, your woman, to be the person, Lord, that you would desire us to be. And we know, Lord, to do that, we have to constantly seek your way and your will. We pray, Lord, that we would stay in that right relationship with you that you would cleanse us and forgive us of the past and let it go help us let it go to get rid of the guilt and the struggles and those things that tend to bind us up lord help us to put them in in the past and help us to see lord you desire to do a new thing in us now to make us a new creature a new creation oh lord help us to know even in this day two thousand years after you've given yourself on the cross to be able to know, Lord, you're still at work, even today, in our lives. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Well, it's been a wonderful day in the house of the Lord as we have welcomed our new district superintendent, Dr. Larry Briars, and his wife, Vicki. I invite uh, all of you to greet them on the back porch if you didn't have a chance to, uh, on the front porch, if you didn't have a chance to greet them earlier and welcome them to our uh, district. We are just so delighted that you're with us this morning and that you're our new, um, our new leader. Brand new. This last week, we went and got Luke, my nine-year-old, a brand new bicycle. It's got gears and the handbrakes. Every morning, he wakes up thinking about that bicycle. And when he goes to bed, 
He's thinking about that brand new bicycle. You know that song, I want to ride my bicycle, I want to ride my bike? It's in his mind all the time because it's brand new. The scripture today, the message is, I, the Lord, make all things new. I do a new thing. God wants to do a new thing in your life, in our church, in our district, in our conference. Give your life to Christ. You wake up every morning excited. God has made you new. May the grace of Christ go with you wherever he may send you. May he guide you through the wilderness, protect you through the storm. May he bring you home rejoicing at the wonders he has shown you. May he bring you home rejoicing once again into our doors. Amen.